Okay, long story short, you guys voted for Papyrus of Dread, so here it is. I've condensed this one down so it only focuses on scenes that are associated with him, that he appears in, that feature his brothers, or anything really that really focuses around his particular story and development through his romance, okay? If you want to see the full story, check out Sans or Gaster's Road. Okay, bye! Hello my little stars and welcome to If Mafia Fell by the Dot Pell 16. This spy here is the Lost Brothers Route, aka Papyrus, the youngest brother. And as you can see, I've given him a beautiful orange daffodil. Since his brothers, Sans has got a pink daffodil and Gaster has got a blue daffodil. So of course I'm gonna give Papyrus the lovely orange daffodil. The colors didn't really matter. I couldn't exactly have the exact color I wanted. So yeah, we improvised. It's a lot better than giving them a yellow daffodil considering there is a wretched Dr. Rose who likes yellow roses. So let's just get on with the show. Chapter 2, Dreaming of You. Your brother smiles easily. It doesn't matter how his day went. A small act of kindness at the end of it would always bring out a smile. That's what you miss most, his smile. Your lives were turbulent and volatile, but he never stopped smiling for you. Maybe he knew how much that smile meant, m means to you. Most nights nice you dream about him. You dream of the happier memories as often as the scary ones. While the rough outweigh the bad, you try to focus on the good. You want to remember his smile. You want to remember the way he calls you, me, me, me. You didn't know why he chose that wretched nickname. You asked him once and he gave you a strange smile. It suits you, was all he said to you. It suits you. Ugh. He also had one more name for you that you actually accepted. You are his... Angel. You love your brother. You love remembering him through your dreams. That night you don't dream of him. You dream of a vermilion fire engulfing you. What? It comes without warning. There's no smoke, no heat, no change in the air to alert you. You are fine until you're not. Familiar flames are roughed around you. What? Okay, you see the tip of your fingers and glaze through your skin. The pain is nearly unbearable, yet you cannot even scream. You're engulfed in agony. Hello, human. A silent scream is caught in your throat. Well, that's one way to introduce yourself, Papyrus. I know I have that effect on humans, apparently. Okay, so, so you mean to tell me? Papyrus, my, my, so what was that? I told you that the skeletons were hot. Don't you think that was a bit extreme? What can I say? He's freaking hot and handsome. Smack. Ow! Look, it's me warning you. Can you warn me in the least dangerous and painful way? No way. No pain, no gain. You want to woo some skellies? You have to feel the burn. That's a bit extreme. I know, but it's the best way for it. Especially when dealing with papyrus. <sighs> Human, I'm getting quite concerned about you and your soul. You seem to be having constant kerfuffles. It's fine, it's fine. I've got this handled, I have this handled. <sighs> oh well. You try to scream as you lurch up, but you can't make any noise. Dilapidating pain all over your skin brings tears to your eye. You're desperately stuck in large gulps of air. Your heart pounds as you tremble in bed. Oh, you're in bed. You're okay. You're, you're turning your hands, double checking. You're not on fire. Slowly, shakily, you calm down. You try to take deep breaths, although you hiccup when you breathe. You glance at the clock. You swallow roughly. Your skin tickles like a sunburn. It would completely throw off your entire schedule if you got up now, and you try to lay back down. You hope you dream of some place cold, <laughs> like Antarctic. <laughs> you wake up without issue in the morning, but. You make your bed as you do every morning, although you feel more tired than normal. The nightmare lingers in the back of your mind. Well, yeah, I mean, you were literally being burnt alive. Where is this? A, a kind of like a premonition of future events in horror tales on the shit? You take a peek at some of your clothes hung up to dry. You decide you don't want to wear any reds or oranges for a while. 
Really? What about yellow? Fire also has a bit of yellow in it. You're completely fine with yellow. And too bad. Orange is what Papyrus is wearing in his pocket. A little orange daffodil. And I chose orange without realising that this was going to happen. So now I feel absolutely foolish about giving Papyrus the orange daffodil if I'm suddenly going to be against the colours of red and orange. Good lord, I have traumatised my character and hence included something that's going to like physically traumatise her or trigger this memory because I gave him an orange daffodil. How was I supposed to know that the nightmare get with Papyrus is being put on fire? I'm guessing he burnt something in the kitchen. I don't know, make up your own mind what happened here. Why are we on fire? I mean, I know he's hot, but is he really that hot? Of course he is. Shut up, Soul. I wasn't asking you. I was asking people out there. But I'm your Soul. You need to listen to me. You're getting me in so much trouble. I know. But as I said, all's fair in love and war. And all's fair in the turmoils of the heart. You are so creepy. Well, you're voicing me. I know. You are sluggish. Even after you drink your chocolate milk, you feel out of it of sorts. Hopefully, your morning run will make you feel better. Your run does nothing to ease you. You take a sh long, hot shower and scrub your ivory skin raw with your honey-scented soap. You normally like your water comfortably hot, but when the water touches your skin, it feels unbearable. You flinch away from it. After a moment's thought, you reluctantly decide to take a cold shower today. This isn't good. You need to pull yourself together. Okay, so right now, anything that's, like, at all... Like, for our character right here, the mate, like the thought of something hot touching us is freaking us out a bit. Isn't good. You need to pull yourself together. You work this evening trip tonight, so you have a lot of time. You finish in getting ready. You force yourself to move slowly, carefully. You're in control of yourself, not your nightmares, not your memories. You slip on a floral dress and you shiver, and you wrap yourself up in a blanket. You finish up your hair later, when it's close to your time to leave. You have hours left in your day before you have to go to work. You actually have time to do something extra for you. It would be nice. It might make you feel better. Well, why not do some... Let's do some crocheting. I don't know how to crochet for the life of me. I have some lovely commission made crochet dolls that I have of three of my characters. Of Rara, Lumina, and then this amazing one of Emperor. My, um, from my Phoenix tale. And then I also have another one of Julius Jorgen from Wakfu that I had custom made. And I absolutely freaking love him. My goodness. Anyway, um, there's nothing better than a homemade sweater. You made all of your sweaters. You used to make your brother's sweaters too. Anna, your co-worker, shares this hobby with you. The two of you will sometimes hang out over the weekend and crochet together. You'll swap finished products. It doesn't happen often as her children take up most of her time. But it's always nice when it does. Right now you're working on, um, let's work on a scarf. Papyrus likes scarves. I'm thinking ahead. He might like a nice scarf. You feel much better. You enjoy your hobby. It makes you happy and relaxed. It's not too expensive to maintain, so it's one of the simpler pleasures you consistently allow yourself. Although you have to admit, you have one other interest. If you were Richard, you would love to um, be a ballet, da a ballet dance. The class has always been too expensive to make that much of a time commitment. Lawrence used to always tell you to dream big when you went to school. Perhaps dreaming of dancing is big, but when you live paycheck to paycheck, the expense it takes to make it happen feels big to you. You start to pick up your things. Your mug is dry, so you put it back in the cabinet. The creaks when you open it. Your eyes swipe over the countertop. You brush your hand over it. Oh, it must be neat for you to get a treat, says the creepy voice of said woman. Your nose wrinkles and you immediately scratch at your ears. You hate remembering her sing-song voice. Already you can smell the overbearing stench of bleach as your hands burn. Ugh. You absentmindedly rub your hand. The nightmare must have tired you out more than you thought. You glance at your clock. It is time for work. You choose to leave and you put up your pumps and the pair of white gloves and you're out the door. Okay, so I will be returning back shortly when we get the scenes with Papyrus. As a bonus, 
For Daisy liking you, you get a special discount in ordering posters from a flower shop. Okay, so we just went to the flower shop and we met with Daisy and now we're going to read this part here from Daisy. As a bonus for Daisy liking, you get a special discount in ordering posters. Her sister works at the printing press. Daisy takes her order and comes back a few weeks later with stacks of new missing person posters of your brother Lawrence who stupidly got lost one day and you've yet to find him and it's been five years. And in that time, a lot of stuff has happened and this city has just gone from worse to terrible to hell. It's almost time to put up a new batch as the old ones have become worn down from the weather. You aren't sure if they make a difference. Five years of putting them up and you've yet to receive a clue, but there's not much else you can do. You have to keep trying. He will never give up on you, so you will never give up on him. All right, little daffodil lover, she says, her voice soft and her eyes full of sympathy. You already have the money ready and you hand it to her over the counter, ignoring the look she gives you. She puts the money away. It'll be some time until the posters are ready. Before you go, she says, how about a corsage? For what? Because, she says, you're alive. Isn't that reason enough? Yes, it is. Because miraculously I'm still alive, considering I've been in this city for five years. You give her a smile and she takes us a yes and happily moves around her shop to pluck a few flowers. Hypothetically, she says, if you are interested in some company. No, this... Oh, you're no fun. Can't you answer a few questions? She bats her eye from... For me? When you don't respond, she offers a counteroffer. For some freshly made chocolate ice cream? You answer. You agree to answer some questions for that. I mean, it's ice cream. You're not going to say no to it. Especially not in this weather, which is why you're hearing the fan in the background. So I'm sorry if you can't stand the sound of the fan. Unfortunately for you, it is way too hot in here. And if I'm going to get these recordings done, yeah, you're going to have to just deal with it. Her laughter bounces around the shop, lighter and brighter than the warm noon sun that filters in. My darling daffodil lover, I do appreciate your st- I do adore your standards. You giggle. Where would you want to go on a date? Hmm, with papyrus. A very nice restaurant. That sounds good with papyrus. And of course, your favourite foods. Why not? Papyrus would, would happily make food. Let's just face facts here. It's papyrus, of course. She smiles at that, and in a relationship, would you rather take the lead or have your partner do it? Again, I would still prefer my partner to initiate, but, you know, Papyrus is a bit more shy, so he might not do it. Ta-da, all done, she says. She takes the corsage made up of pink, because of her soul, and orange flowers, because of um, my favourite flower. But the problem here is my character just had a nightmare, so she obviously doesn't want to look at the colour orange, so I, what can I say? What can I say? Wow, you're so mean to your character. I didn't know. How was I supposed to know my character was suddenly get triggered by the colour orange? I couldn't have foreseen that. I didn't know how he was going to, you know, cause a nightmare. What you were going to make happen. That's your fault, not mine. I mean, your warning for Sans was suffocating, spicy, red smoke that suffocates. And then for Wingadings, it was hands in the inky goopy abyss with tentacles. And his one, fire. Vermilion fire. You couldn't find a different way to warm me? A less dangerous or traumatic way? Nah, I thought this adds a bit more spice to life. And you know, it just emphasises how hot they are. Rawr. (sighs) Flick. Ah! You thank her for the cassage. And thank you for your time, she says. You're going to work? Yes. Be safe, she says. You will. You always are. (laughs) No, you're only safe when I allow you to be safe, or you're only safe when you're not allowed to be in charge. You step out into the sunlight and you flinch as the weight it burns against your face for only a split second. At once, you are reminded of that dream. The nightmare is lingering on you. There's a warm tingling in your chest. Oh my stars, it's been five years since last you felt that. But it doesn't matter. You know this feeling. You know what it means. Your pa taught you many things. He taught you how to be brave, how to be afraid. He taught you to stand firm, how to take a hit. He taught you how to persevere, and no matter how badly it hurts. But the most important uh, lesson he ever taught you was how to trust your instincts, trust your soul. Your soul is special. It's strong and powerful, and a bit of an idiot, because it's inside of an idiot. Hi. Shut up, stop being satient. Though you're 
Through your soul, you've had near flawless intuition when it comes to your safety, and to past lessons, this ability grew to its current state. It's how you avoided death. It's how you and Lawrence succeeded in evading power when you fled into the night. Yeah, it's a shame Lawrence didn't inherit a soul like that, isn't it? Because he probably would have saved him too, but apparently he's not special enough to have a special soul. Your instincts know where to go in dangerous situations and how to survive, as if you've already done it before and learned from your mistake. The ability isn't something you advertise. And the last time this ability was triggered, it led to your brother's disappearance. Yeah, and sadly, there's something more about your dream. It's for a fifth duke. It's a warning. Are you going to listen to it? Absolutely not, because we're trying to romance the danger. That a girl, get in there! Okay, so our appearance name is Twinkle. Nicknames are <laughs> an angel. Eye color is pink. Soul color is pink. Hair length long, white, tightly curled. Skin is ivory, and we're scented like honey. Your favorite flower is an orange daffodil. Unfortunately, for my character, who can't stand the sight of orange and red at the moment. Oh well. Your morning drink is chocolate milk, and your preferred breakfast is yogurt with fruit. Your favorite dessert is chocolate ice cream, and you typically wear a floral dress with a pair of white gloves and pumps. Okay, your apartment is warm and cozy and nice. It would be a nice restaurant with good food, and a good gift would be chocolate ice cream. You wake up on time without issue. I'm not sure how you managed to do it. You're a singer. Warm tingle giggles in a romantic relationship with your partnership. Your arm papyrus is route. Let's commit. Oh, as your pumps click against the sidewalk, you catch a whiff of a unique spicy smoke scent on the wind. The smell tickles your nose and it's gone by the second whiff. Strange. This is, of course, the second whiff sounds apparently, I'm guessing, sensed your soul. I'm assuming that's what this is meant to represent. It's like the moment they become aware of the special soul because winger Jings mentions it as well in his route and sans does too so they've become aware of your soul um upon them coming into the city because it's so unique that even as the ralty also says it too whereas car mentions that your soul is like nothing special it's kind of boring so apparently our soul is so unique that it's getting everyone's attention which is something okay i'll be right back now, after, of course, we went into the Black Swan and we got dressed, um, as you leave the back room where you were changing, the front door to the Black Swan opens up. Your nose tickles and you catch a familiar whiff of something spicy and smoky. You turn your head and look at a group of gentlemen entering the Black Swan. There are five men and one monster. Three of the men you recognise as regulars and you know them to be part of that ugh, vi family. The other two are fresh faces and the monster... You haven't seen this monster before, but you definitely smelt that wretched smoke of his. You're certain of it. Monsters don't come into the Black Swan often. The ones that do are the ones that have ties to one of the families. Monsters are considered the best muscle for hire, if you can afford them, due to their incredible magic, tough durability, and some of them have immunity to common human weapons. Fancy. Monsters are large, always. Even short monsters easily hit six feet. I am very, very, very jealous. I am very small. <laughs> and this monster is no exception to that rule. He is large on, by every account and is dressed in a fine black suit with a black tie. He wears a suit hat to match and on his hands, even at a distance, you can see gold rings on his finger. It takes you a few seconds to realise his fingers are bony. He's a skeleton monster. Ooh, you hadn't met one of those before. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely freaking lying. You've already met this one. Shut up, soul. We haven't met him in this route. The only monster you've encountered prior have been Canine or Rodante. Huh? You dismissed it from your mind. You doubt anyone wants to be oogled at due to their appearance. You have work to do. You are all too eager to finish your shift. You change in your casual clothes and walk out the front door. All went All went well. Whoa. You turn your head to the source of the loud voice, startled by it. You notice that the skeleton from, from before, the one with the red smoke, is standing beside another one. Oh my god, it's the hot papyrus! Oh, be still in my beating heart! Shut up, soul! This one is a tall, very tall, with similar black suit and hat. He's skinnier than the first one and has a longer face with a bigger spiky mouth. All went well, passed the shorter skeleton. Come on, I told you I could handle and I did. Yes, well, the tall one's voice carries over to you. It's a booming voice, but you like it. No, 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 you don't like it. You love it. Eh? 
You wonder what it'd be like in a duet with you. <laughs> Papaya singing. Oh my goodness. As if sensing your attention, the tallest skeleton glances in your direction. Oh my. Vermilion. He has vermilion eye lights in his eye sockets. You notice also there are a couple of scars running down his left side of his face across his eye socket. Oh, bless. Oh, that's weird. You're used to your soul only reacting to danger. You feel a warm, ticklish heat in your chest. The skeleton gives you a slow nod as an acknowledgement. You smile politely in return and start to head home. Huh. He seems kind of cute. Kind of cute? He's freaking hot. What are you talking about? This is why I should be in charge of this adventure. Shut up, Sil. Also, if you notice, he doesn't give us, like, with papyrus, he doesn't give us that, like, feeling of, like, fear compared to, like, Sans and them. Because out of the three brothers, he's not, like, hostile. You don't really need to be that concerned with papyrus. Papyrus is not going to do anything to you. He's much more shyer than the other two. And he's he's definitely a gentleman all the way through. He's a, He's a sweet cinnamon. Okay, so we will, of course, return once we get back home, if you know what I mean. Sorry, Ralsei, we're going to completely ignore you. <laughs> so now, of course, we've now reached Chapter course, 3, so I'm going to skip forward and get all the juicy parts that we're most interested in, and, yeah, Hello. summarise any parts I'll I need to. Be right back. So, how did my morning start before I head to work? Well, allow me to tell you, it's quite an interesting story. First of all, I woke up in the middle of the night. There were sounds of screamings, gunshots, and all sorts of things. Turns out the neighbours were having a party, and they got way too riley up, to the point that apparently a gang came along and decided to cart her off, and a couple of men into a black van, never to be seen again. And also, one man got shot, which was very unfortunate. But hey, you can't party without a couple of eggs getting broken, you know. Kids, I don't do what these people do. <laughs> Moving on with the story. So as I decided to leave my apartment, I saw a poor man weeping over, of course, the unfortunate event resulting in his son not getting invited to the party and unfortunately instead getting the gift of a bullet. It was very unfortunate, we really. <clears throat> Moving on, the next thing that happened then was I decided to head off to visit Daisy, who proceeded to then tell me about a serial killer that apparently returned as well. Quite a nice morning so far, right? Everything's going great. And what I do after that? Simple. I then decided to go get some groceries and something to eat, where I then overheard a couple of women talking about apparently, um, well... <sighs> Moving on, I almost forgot and I'll add this in now. I also bumped into Ralsei. I almost completely forgot considering all the other bad stuff that kept happening. So yeah, he got lost. We found him. Yeah, yes. Uh, maybe something more nice will happen. We'll pretend all that stuff didn't happen in this, okay? At least she got like a slow summary. Feel free to watch Gaster's route. I literally go through all of the scenes there. That was just me just summarising it as short and simple as possible. Anyway, it's time to head to work now, right? We'll forget about the death, murder, the, the kidnapping and stuff. None of that matters. I got a job to go to. I need to be a normal person. You ain't normal. You have the hot for a skeleton. Shut up, Sal. You arrive at work 10 minutes before your shift starts, and as soon as you walk in, you notice a change in the air. The air feels fluttery and warm. What the hell are you on? Give me! You look around and your souls are flutter. You find a familiar vermilion gaze. Oh, it's the monster from last night. The one with the nice, booming voice. He sits in the far back alone at the table with one drink at the table. He notices you, and you notice him. <laughs> Oh, you shyly smile and nod to him. He tips his hat to you, and your smile widens. Ticklish butterflies are in your stomach. You feel a hand on your arm, and you turn your head to look to Anna. Anna, don't interrupt. I'm currently, you know, making eyes with papyrus over here. What's up with you? Did I invite you over? No, go away, woman. I'm trying to, like, impress the skeleton over here, and you kind of, you know, cramp my style. Exactly, move over. She's already out of her uniform. She must be getting ready to leave since her shift ended when you saw it. The bubbly mother whispers to you. I see you found our guest. I have indeed spotted the guest. Hew hew. Boss introduced him on the first shift, she said. Says to keep him well fed and watered, but ignore him outside of that. Why would I do any of that? Also, seriously, it makes it sound like he's a plant. Oh, 
that's not what it means much to you. You aren't a waitress. Just keep in mind if you get pulled to help the tables, she said. You nod and thank her for the heads up. Anna beams at you and pats your arm. Have a good evening, honey. You tell her to do the same and hope her kids are doing well. Well enough, she says, rolls her eyes. Jackson, Jason broke a window playing baseball last night. You saw the bot. Uh, uh, we saw a party going on out, yeah, outside the window last night. It's fine. He was just playing apple bobbing from the window. It's fine. <clears throat> anyway, Anna decides to leave after causing my PTSD to start up and make me visualize bodies hanging out of windows. <laughs> Thanks, Anna. Anna leaves you and you go to the back room. As you enter, you see Wendy hopping out of the changing room, clicking her tongue in annoyance. As soon as she sees you, she beams, Twinkle, help! Please, my wretched dress is keeping me captive again! And my freaking hair is stuck in my zipper! Poor girl, so I'm going to go and help her now. After, of course, we helped her get her hair unstuck, she said, You noticed the monster? She asks you as you move to the changing room. She waits outside you while you change. You did. Kind of strange, she said. He looks strong. There ain't any regulars that are high ranked enough to afford someone like him, right? You can't think of anyone. So who's he waiting for? Why does she think he's waiting for someone? Why else would he be here? She chuckles. Maybe he's got a date. This place can get romantic in the evening. She taps on the changing room door. You should sing a love song tonight. Bet he'll tip you well if you put his date in the right mood. For some reason, this makes you frown. Is my character a freaking idiot? Is she is my character like completely unaware of the fact that we feel attracted to him? You finish changing and step out, and she notices your frown. What? Not a good idea. You raise the hand and touch your frown. Curious for it. I'm going to smack you. Are you meaning to tell me you can't work it out that you have Oh This is why I'm in charge of the feelings around here. He's freaking hot! Oh, she smiles. Well, sing what you want. Whatever you sing will be nice. Good luck tonight, Twinkle. You tell her the same and the two of you head out to work while you literally debate on whether you should strangle your main character or not. As in the back room, you, you feel Wendy brush past you. Her hands are gentle as she kindly pats your back and heads to her section. You can't resist looking over at the skeleton monster in the back. And as soon as you do, he also lifts up his head. You two meet each other's eyes again. You quickly look away, your cheeks warm, you're smiling. You start your work and you get up on stage. Well, this is going to be interesting. Can I actually sing with him there? You step up on stage, the stage light turning on when you reach the microphone. Singers only work on the evening shift and then a jazz band takes over the night shift. You work in one hour burst, then take a small break to sit down, drink water and take song requests. At the end of your shift, the boss always has a hot meal prepped for you to eat before you go home. With the stage lights focused on you, it's difficult to see the face in the audience. You hardly ever see someone's eyes. Tonight was different. Oh no. You start with your usual set of songs, staring out at the normal spots you focus your vision on, so you don't get blinded. Then your pink light eyes flicker to where the monster sits. You see vermilion lights pop out. Yeah, because they, they glow, don't they? So it's like hard not to notice him. I mean, literally, everybody else is like in darkness and you've got the bright lights on you. Of course they're going to pop out. It'll be like if winged things are sitting in the audience or freaking sands. Especially sands. You look away. Can't get caught staring at one member for too long. And your smile reflectively widens. It keeps happening throughout your entire work shift. You keep looking his way and he catches your gaze each time. I mean, <laughs> poor Vampirus. I'm really curious what he must be thinking. You're... <laughs> oh no. <laughs> you giggle in the middle of your favorite song and though you can't see his expression do the spotlights on you, you feel as if he's smiling at you. <laughs> oh, that's cute. Where's my water? <clears throat> At the end of your last song, you curtsy it and start to head off the stage. A large bony hand is extended out to you. When did he get that? Did he freaking... Did he walk over? What the heck? That was quick he got there. What the... Where was he? Did he get up and walk over? Or did he just use little magic teleporty powers? Goodness knows. You notice that you swallow and accept the hand. 
looking up to see if those vermilion eyes fixated on you. Oh my. You have a beautiful voice, says the monster. You thank him. You did not introduce yourself before you sang, he says. What is your name? Oh my goodness. You introduce yourself. He raises your hand and presses his jagged mouth to it. Oh my goodness gracious me, we have a gentleman in the house. Hey! Bubbly butterflies make you giggle. I am Papyrus Gaster, he says. It is a pleasure to meet you. It is a pleasure to meet you too, and I can't wait for you to become the boss of this place. Hew, hew, hew. Mm. He helps you off stage. Have you worked here for long? Four years. Do you like it? You like it well enough. I see. Do you intend to keep working here? Yes. Good, he says. Good? Do not worry, human. You will understand soon enough. He has escorted you to the back room, as if he knew that's where you were headed. Oh, wait. Ho hold on. How did you know where I was going? Should I be concerned that he knows my routine as well? Are they all watching me? Did Sans tell him? Probably Sans would tell him, right? I'm guessing. I think that all the skeletons are watching me. Good night, Miss Twinkle. Your cheeks burn as you whisper good night to Papyrus. Oh, oh my, hum and then, uh, hmm. You take your dinner to go happy with a productive day of work. Huh? Oh, oh no, wait. Oh, we're about to bump into Wingadings. I might as well include Wingadings here as well. The streets are empty outside your apartment. You speed up when you see the front door of the building, anxious to get inside and eat. There's a warm tingle in your chest. You look around. You don't see anyone. You grip your dinner with one hand tighter and quickly head to the front door. As soon as you grab the handle, you feel it again. There's a warm tingle in your chest. You open the door, concerned the danger is inside. If, okay, logically, character, I need to ask you a really good question, which I fail to ask you every other time. If you have a feeling that the danger is inside the building, why go towards the danger? Because the danger is sexy and it's hot. Yeah, but logically speaking, we're not after Gaster in this one. We're not after Don Winger things. So why are we going towards the dangerous entity if we know it's possibly inside the building? We only have got a plate of food to defend ourselves with. What are we going to do? Toss it at him? He'll tentacle smack it away. Yeah, but we don't know that. Oh my. Are you trying to get with me right now? Hmm? Talking about my tentacles already and they haven't even come out. And besides, they're called tendrils, not tentacles. Tentacles are something completely different. You get what I mean. We meet with your shadows. I didn't know that you were into tentacles. Oh my god, Gaster, not now. We're after papyrus and it's not you. Yes, I know, but this is my scene. I'm allowed to speak during it. Don't even count on it, bro. Twinkle does not allow that. Mm. You open the door, concerned that the danger is inside. There is someone there. They are tall. You do not see their head or face immediately. Instead, you see a buttoned up black shirt tucked neatly into black suit pants. There is an expensive looking black coat draped over the owner's shoulder, and you see black gloved hands clenched either side. There's a warm tingle in your chest, and you slowly raise your gaze. He is a skeletal monster with bony white face and a terrifying spiked mouth. There's a crack going down his right eye socket to his mouth and another crack from his left eye socket across the top of his head. Two violet red eye lights set coldly down at you. A shiver of fear slides down your spine. You can see me, he asks, his voice barely above a whisper. Why wouldn't you? It is then that you notice there are wisps of shadows around him. There's a warm tingle in your chest and you... Follow your response and nod. Unfortunate is all he says, and he disappears into the shadows. You hope that was the right response. Also, at least he didn't say, he didn't swear at me this time and say that I have bad timing, so that's something. He's just like, well then, I can't go creeping around the place, can I, using my shadows with you around? You're very aware. The dinner is called by the time you feel calm enough to eat it. It's still delicious. The boss knows how to make great food. Once you've eaten, you do your nightly routine. You wash your face, brush your teeth, change into your short nightdress and stretch. You are reminded of the man from before and shiver. There's a knock at your door. It's rather late for visitors. So we're going to now skip forward again and I'll see you guys in a little bit. 
here we are now at chapter four, a new boss. So, like I said, any scenes that you don't see in this place of Papyrus, go and watch Sansa's route or Gaster's route. I would highly recommend watching Don Wingeding's route since I cover everything in that one. I go for all the clues and stuff. So again, just a reminder, if you want to see all the scenes without them being cut out, head to Don Wingeding's playthrough. Otherwise, you can watch my first time playing through it via Sansa's playthrough. Okay, let's carry on, shall we? All right, so we've already headed to work. Now, you enter the Black Swan. For some reason, you think the air smells fresher in the restaurant than outside. You notice them right away. Vermilion eyelights are lifted up to meet your gaze. What exactly is vermilion? Is vermilion like a shade of red? I don't actually know exactly what vermilion is. Is it like a darky red color? Your cheeks warm as you smile at him and he returns your smile. Papyrus is seated at the bar with the boss, Mr. Eel. Mr. Eel notices you coming in and he waves you over to them. You lean major weight to them. Mr. Eel is the black swan's owner. He prefers his employees refer to him as boss. A tough, grumbly old man with dark skin, dark hair and naturally blue eyes. He is a rare human with enough magic in him to cast spells, but not enough to qualify for magic training at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, as I've said many times before. But the vibrance in his eyes mark him as special, just as my soul marks me as special. But unfortunately for me, my soul is annoying. So is my character at times. You've never seen Mr. Eel use magic, although many patrons joke he uses it to make his food taste so good. Easier, lass, says Mr. Eel. No need for you to rush over here. You shyly look away, mildly embarrassed to be called out for hurrying over. You two know each other, Mr. Eel asks you. Miss Twinkle and I have been introduced, says Papyrus. Good, he said. Child, I've sold the swan to this here gentleman. Your eyes widen. You don't even know the restaurant was for sale. It wasn't, Mr. Eel responds. This year lad simply drove a hard bargain. Your old boss shrugs. It ain't a springing... I ain't a springy anymore. It's about time I think of settling down. You knew Mr. Eel wasn't young, well into his 70s, but you never thought he'd retire. He always had so much energy and was live lively in the kitchen with the other chefs. He was an excellent boss who took care of all his employees. You saw to see him go, and yet you look over at Papyrus. The skeleton is keenly watching your reaction. Your cheeks burn and you snap your attention back to Mr. Eel. Huh? says Mr. Eel, a faintly amused look on his face. You stiffen at his reaction. He's like, oh, I see. Um, well then, I hope you're going to still be able to do your job if you got the hots for the new boss. Mr. Eel. What I'm just saying, I hope you can focus with this strapping young man here. <laughs> huh. Huh. He says again, a white smile on his face. You know, little Wendy was telling me you wouldn't be too bad if you happy to see me go lassie <laughs> no 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 no! it's not that i swear it's not that i'm happy to see you go that's not what this is it's just unfortunately apparently i find papyrus 10 times more attractive that's overwhelming my feelings of sadness he laughs loudly clapping his knees your panty face <laughs> he gives you a hard pat on your shoulders don't you worry mr papyrus promise to not replace any of you without good concern and i know you'll be just fine lass and you know how to reach me if something comes up. Rest assured, Miss Twinkle says Papyrus, you will not lose your job. That's, that's good. The assessment Papyrus had told about yesterday must have related to this. You're curious now, how well did you do? Well enough to not lose your job, but perhaps you lift your pink eyes to look into Papyrus' eye lights. You feel warm and fluttery and, and I need a drink again. God damn it, why is it so hot today? <laughs> A bubbly joy fills you up from the inside. It's difficult to keep his gaze without breaking into a grin. Something you feel too shy to do. You break away first. Hehe, <laughs> Mr. Eel seems tickled pink. Looks l <laughs> Looks like I'll be coming back as a guest a lot sooner than I plan. Oh my god. <laughs> He's like, I need to see how this develops between you two. If indeed you don't have a kid, I would love to, for, for you to name it, like, Eel Jr. or something. <laughs> no. You're always welcome back, Mr. Eel, says Papyrus. So the lass, eh? What the hell? 
Mr. Eel laughs again. Papyrus pointedly coughs. The barest hint of red colour appears under his eye sockets. He says, returning to, to business, Mr. Eel. Oh my god, Papyrus has a crush. Eee! So very cute. And Mr. Eel's like, uh huh, so you have a thing for Twinkle, do you? Uh huh? <laughs> Don't make it obvious. Ah, uh, for all the work and all pain makes for a dull man, Mr. Papyrus. <laughs> I love Mr. Eel. Work, work time is for work, he says. We are at work. We should be working. Mr. Eel grumbles. Aye, aye. Get along, lassie. Yes, sir. Work time is for work, so you get to work. <laughs> Oh, poor Papyrus. Or you do your best. It's truly as uncanny how often you keep meeting Papyrus's gaze. As with the previous night, you're instinctively drawn to him. You understand his sentiment of work time is for work, so you actively try to fight the urge, but, well, you aren't the only one struggling with it. Oh, bless. Oh, look at our baby bro. He's found himself a little human. Oh, isn't it adorable? Oh, sweet little baby bones. Quiet, you two! I'm at work! Don't interrupt with your false wall barricading! Oh, but you're absolutely adorable. Sans, do you have a camera? I can get one in about an easy click of a tongue. I have the camera. Brothers! Familiar eye lights shine every time they meet your pink ones. The first few times it happens in the shift you quickly look away halfway through you scrounging up the courage to meet his gaze he smiles your heart wants to jump out of your chest and do a dance wait your heart wants to jump out of his chest and do a dance i'm very concerned if it's coming what is our heart doing in his chest oh my near the end of your shift it is as if the high school marching band did a performance in your chest your poor heart is a mess every time he smiles at you my face is a mess right now. My goodness. <laughs> you change out of your work uniform, then head out the front door. To your pleasant surprise, Papyrus is there. Oh my goodness. Oh, oh my. Do I have another ball? I do. Oh, thank goodness. Mm. The tall monster has a hand in his suit pants pocket and the other holds a black carton. It's the same type of carton that is used for carrying out food at the Black Swan. He stands at the bottom of the steps, his skull tilted up to watch the stairs, the stars twinkling above. You nervously look around and wonder if he's waiting for someone. He notices you. Good evening, Miss Twinkle, says Papyrus. You shyly return his greeting. I noticed you did not have time to eat tonight, he says. It was a busy night. Work is important, he allows. But so is your health. Going forward, I expect you to take appropriate breaks regardless of how busy it gets. Oh, he holds out the carton to you. Mr. Eel prepared this for you before he left. He's tall enough that you do not need to go down any steps to take it. You gingerly accept it and mumble soft thank you. Oh my goodness, I just imagine Papyrus like picking you up as well to hug you. Because <laughs> I'm tiny, imagine. My goodness. He's so tall then. I knew he was tall. I didn't think he'd be that tall. Oh my good gracious me. Oh my good golly. Oh, oh, tumbling weeds and stars. Oh gosh, my me. You gingerly accepted a mumble a thank you. Then you lift your gaze back up to me, Papyrus. You see he's smiling at you. Oh my god, this is so freaking adorable. <sighs> you notice that. He notices that you notice and immediately stops. He adjusts his tie. Do you like the food at the Black Swan? It's good food. For human food? Says Papyrus, a tinge of reluctance in his voice. Oh, hold on. Let me read that again. Do you like the food at the Black Swan? It's good food. For human food? Says Papyrus, a tinge of reluctance in his voice. You've never had monster food before, so you have no way to compare. Really? Papyrus's brow raised as his eyelids shrink. His look of surprise is endearing to you. He recovers quickly enough. That, that is a shame. You should try it. You nod as you look down. You fidget it with the carton food. If you, if you would like, you lift your head back up and Paris's cheekbones are a shade similar to his eyes. I will make some for you, he boldly offers. Oh my God, can I hug him? 
Oh, he's so freaking adorable. Oh, poor Bean, he's so freaking shy. Oh, look at him trying. Oh gosh, bless. <laughs> <coughs> Your demeanor brightens. Yes, you would like that. Of course you would. I am an excellent chef. Ah, oh, there we go again. There's his pride. He says. Papyrus offers you one of his hands, and you accept it with a giggle. You should be careful going down steps, he explains. While the steps outside the black swan can be hazardous at winter if it's covered in ice, you haven't thought of them as dangerous on fair weather tonight. Who cares? Just accidentally trip and fall into his arms is fine. He won't judge you. But you aren't going to tell that to Papyrus. He assists you down the stairs, acting as a handrail with surprising care. Oh my goodness. Head straight home, he says. It's too late to linger. Your face is burning and you can't hide your grin. You tell him you will. Good, I will see you tomorrow. Tomorrow? Your face falls. You don't work tomorrow. Normally you would enjoy your day off, however. Right then you feel disappointment. Oh, says Papyrus. When is your night shift? Monday. I will see you Monday, he says. Yes, he smiles at you. Be safe going home. Yes, you stay safe on your journey home. <sighs> Help. That was too freaking adorably cute. I cannot even. <sighs> I need a moment. I will be right back. I need any, any fresh air. <sighs> and I'm back. We are now at chapter five. Call one, two, three. <sighs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. <sighs> Alright, well, like it says here, you don't eat breakfast that morning because we had a terrible nightmare about Robert in the box, but we're not going to talk about Robert. Tomorrow is Monday and you have to go to work. Today, however, you are free. You've already done your morning run and are dressed for the day. What should you do? Well, I'm going to go and do a few things here. And then we'll be right back. Okay, so we've already gone to Daisy's and Daisy told us about the, um, that apparently somebody had been killed by the, oh, what's it called? Dr. Rose. Now we're going to head to buy a new pillow because, yeah, there was a bullet hole through our pillow early on, so. You purchase a new pillow from the furniture shop down the road and then you get your groceries for the week. You carry your groceries in black bags that you bring with you to the store. The paper bags provided by the store don't have handles and more than once you had to the bag split open on your walk home. You unfortunately run out of a lot of things this week, so the bags are bulging with how full they are. Your arms are tired halfway home. Good day, miss. A smooth voice interrupts and there's a warm tingle in your chest. You stumble. You twist around to see a tall monster leaning against a wall in the alleyway. It's the monster you saw outside your home. A stream of melting ice slivers down your spine. The monster takes off his black suit hat and offers you a disarming, charming smile as he bows. In a sweeter than sugar, he says, Thank you for stopping. I was hoping to run into you again. Why? To apologise, of course, he says. His voice low and velvety smooth with a honey-sweet coat. You stare at him, waiting for him to elaborate. I was terribly rude to you, he says. I am deeply sorry for that. You called me at an awful time and I took it out on you. I understand that's no excuse, but I hope you can find in your heart to forgive me. He speaks in that flowery words with a saccharine voice. Lawrence told you those are the most dangerous folks, which means you need to definitely get on his good side. The ones that can use pretty words to hide their knives. He doesn't need knives. He has freaking shadows, tendrils, and void power. He, he needs no knives. There's a warm tingling in your chest. If you would allow me, I'd be happy to help you carry those, offers the monster. You decide to give him a chance. There's no way you're going to anger this one because, yeah, he's technically, what is he, a brother-in-law now? Or going to be if we get that far with Papyrus. <coughs> he shifts his black suit hat back and takes all of the groceries from your arms, leaving you only carrying your soft pillow. There's a warm tingle in your chest. Thank you, he says. Ah, uh, where are my manners? I am Wingedings Gaster. Oh, that's the same last name Papyrus has. Weedings briefly frowns. You know my brother? At the mention of the tall skeleton, your heart skips a beat and you can't hold back your giggle. You tell him that, luckily, Papyrus is your new boss. Weedings studies your reaction looks away. I see. You seem fond of him. 
your cheeks warm, you clear your throat and glance away. The sensation of danger immediately vanishes as you hear wing a dings chuckle. Oh, why? But Paris is my younger brother, he says. Oh, I'm definitely going to have 100% fun teasing my baby brother. Oh, my sweet little baby bones finally found someone after all this time. When it incorrectly assists you all the way to your apartment, he sets the groceries outside your front door and tips his hat to you. It was a pleasure to make your acquaintance, Miss Twinkle, he says politely. I am very grateful you gave me the opportunity to atone for my earlier rudeness. You're happy to meet him too. You thank him for his help. He smiles at you. You're far too kind. <laughs> Take care of yourself, young lady. You watch him leave, then you go to put your groceries away. Okay, so in his route, you of course let him into your apartment, so... He's, he's so amused right now, he's like, oh, my baby brother. He's so freaking cute, he's gone himself a little lady, the little lady likes him. Oh, I can't wait to tease him later. And she works for him. Oh, I could see him coming into the Black Swan and teasing Papyrus throughout, like, one of his work days. Just teasing and winding him up because we're there working. It seems our day is over. It's time to eat dinner and get ready for bed. End your day. Once you've eaten, you do your nightly routine. You wash your face, brush your teeth, and change into your short nightdress and stretch. You start to head to bed. Let's, of course, do the interlude. I'm going to skip over the part with the uh, <coughs> winger things doing winger things things. Oh, but why? That's my... Th Actually, no, never mind. I honestly do think that's the best option. I'd rather not relive that moment. It was quite... Ugh. Not to my standards. See? See, I knew you'd be happy if I skipped over that part for you. My thank you, Twinkle. You're very considerate. Winger Dings returns home in the early hours of Monday morning. He steps out of the shadows, the tendrils lingering around his shoes. As soon as he steps inside, he hears the familiar shouts of his younger brother. Cigarettes out! Winger Dings clicks his tongue. He steps outside, then crunches, crushes his cigarette in his left hand. He dumps the ashes out. The monster re-enters his home and tags his tie loose. He takes off his black jacket and hangs it on the standing coat rack, along with his hat. He notices that there are two other hats on it. He heard Papyrus already, but it looks like his other young brother is home as well. He takes off his shoes and neatly sets them off to the side along. Um, all of their shoes are perfectly lined up at the front, and neither he nor Papyrus would tolerate a messy home. Sansgas enters the front room. The large skeleton monster must have returned home recently. He still has his tie on. Hey, you're back. I am, says Wingerdings. Where were you? Asks Saz. Missed a hell of a game. Wingerdings smiles thinly. Opportunity arose unexpectedly. Which kind? Asks Sans. Do you... Do we need to go out tonight? No, I have finished it, he says. It simply took... Ugh, time. All night? You reek of gunpowder. I had to do it the brutish way. You hate that way. Yes, agrees Wingerdings. Sans thinks for a moment. His eyelids shrink as his eye sockets widen. Wait, did which? The bitch's prodigal son. Sans grins. <laughs> you should have let me know. I would have helped. You had plans, says Wingerdings. I did not. Papyrus enters the front room. Stop loitering. Breakfast will be ready soon. Thank you. Thanks, bro. Wingerdings and Sans say. You are welcome. Wingerdings asks Sans, did you come home recently? Yeah, ten minutes before you, says Sans. Got into a hot streak at Grilby's. Ugh, all the usuals. Plus Kara, says Sans. Brett snuck out again. <laughs> and I had to drag them home again. You should not antagonize the Ramir family by letting their brat play at the bar, Wingerding warns. Papyrus adds, it is not worth getting on their bad side, Sans. How the heck am I responsible for them? It's not even my kid or my bar. Eh, Sans shrugs. Anything else on with your night wings? Night, no. However, earlier yesterday, I did find something interesting. What? asked Papyrus. Winged Ding's lips curl at the end. I met that soul today, he says in a light tone. Uh, the one that saw you? Sounds us? 
Did you deal with them? Papyrus inquires. No, says Wingadings. Sam snorts. Don't tell me the bag of flesh escaped you. I swear to God, Sam. Hey, in my defense, I didn't know it was you in this instance. Okay, let it go. I wouldn't say that. Weeding says in an even tone, his smile stretching. You look too damn smug. What? You fucking first? I think Papyrus would absolutely reprimand his brother and would not talk to him for a long time. Sounds rolls up his sleeves. Go get tested if it burns. <laughs> As if I'm going to have that. Wingdings chuckles. He waits until both of his brothers turn their heads to look at him. So that way he can see their reaction. Her name is Twinkle, says Wingadings. Papyrus stiffens. That's interesting, says Wingadings. What? Papyrus, an edge to his tone. As soon as Sans hears the tone, he turns to face Papyrus. He tilts his head and goes, huh? What? <laughs> Papyrus asks again. His eye sockets narrow. Your reaction is, Sans waves his right hand. Interesting, says Wingadings. Uncharacteristic. What reaction? I did not react. Sans and Wingadings glance at each other. Okay, baby bone, says Wingadings, since you did not react. I did not. You clearly have no attachment to the human, continues Wingadings. Twinkle is my employee, says Papyrus stiffly. Wingadings nod, his tone dubious. I see, so you care for her in a professional manner. Yes. Hmm. Need to need a moment to think that over. Sans grins. Papyrus collides with both and cease this. You will not get a rise out of me. Of course, coos wingedings. Please forgive us. Uh, you are never sincere when you ask that. He's catching on to your wings. Sans says as he elbows wingedings. I knew this day would come. The size wingedings. Huh, our baby Bones is no longer a baby. Huh, one day he's going to fly the nest and get baby Bones of his own. I will hurt both of you! Oh dear, says Wingy Dings, not at all bothered by the threat. Sans snickers. Uh-oh, baby Bones about to throw a tantrum. However, will we survive? Wingy Dings teases. Papyrus tilts his head. Wingy Dings and Sans chuckle to themselves until they realize they are no longer move. They can no longer move. There is a green outline around their bodies. They immediately stop laughing. <laughs> There's only so far you can push that one. Wingy Dings kisses his throat. Um, dearest brother. And I taught me a new trick, says Papyrus. You won't be able to run away. Sans and Wingadings look at one another, silently coming to an agreement. <laughs> Death before dishonour, Wingadings says solemnly. He smiles wickedly. Baby bones. Oh my god. End of interlude. <clears throat> oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> what? We had to tease our baby brother. He's freaking adorable. Look at him. He finally found someone and he just won't admit he's too shy. Aw, oh, poor baby bones. Stop calling me baby bones! Skipping forward a little to this point. You enter the Black Swan excited to see Papyrus again. The tension in the air is thick. There are a lot more patrons at the bar than normal, and you've seen abundance of alcohol on the table. What happened? You frown and look around for Papyrus. You don't see him. A flash of disappointment makes you frown. And you go to the back rooms. And Wendy has finished changing and is tying her hair up. Hey, Twinkle, Wendy greets you. You return a greeting. Weird day, huh? She asks. You have some mighty nod. Does she have any idea what's going on? She shrugs. Your guess is as good as mine. Maybe someone died. A lot of people die every day. Maybe someone important. Maybe. Wendy walks out. You go change into your uniform and hang your casual clothes up in the locker. You step back, content to simply focus on your work. Miss Twinkle! A shot of joy makes you giggle and you turn to Papyrus when he calls for you. The tall skeleton tips his hat to you, a smile on his face. His vermilion eyelids brighten the moment your eyes meet. I wanted to apologize on my brother's behalf, says Papyrus. It has come to my attention he was rude to you. It's fine, Wingadings said he was sorry and even helped you carry 
your groceries. Papyrus smiles at you. That is good still. I hope you do not find working here uncomfortable because of him. Oh no, not at all. You are quickly, you are quick to reassure Papyrus that he's an amazing boss. Your voice comes out squeakier than intended and you hope Papyrus does not notice how warm your cheeks are. The skeleton monster seems pleased by this, a faint reddish hue forming into his eye sockets. Oh my. Uh, of course I am an excellent boss. I've had years of practice managing my brother. You giggle. Papyrus's vermilion eye lights glimmer. If either of my brothers bothers you, you may come to me and I will set them straight. You shyly thank him. You are welcome. Uh, while I have you here, Wednesday, the Black Swan will be closed. Papyrus clears his throat. You, you should come here, though. I will cook for you. <laughs> oh, he's so freaking adorable. Oh, look at him. Oh, bless. Oh. <laughs> yes, I, I am testing recipes in the kitchen to ensure that the human chefs will be able to replicate them here, says Papyrus. I'm offering you the chance to try my cooking. Oh, your eyes brighten. Yes, yes, that sounds very nice. You're glad you accept. Good. Be here by noon. You will. Oh, <laughs> He's so precious, isn't he? Yeah, we really love our baby bones. Both of you leave me alone. After some teasing. Here we are at chapter six, lessons. So the same thing as before. If at all you want to see any particular scenes, check out Gaster's route for everything covered. Check out Sansa's route for, of course, my first time reactions. I'm going to now go and find our skeletons and be back. Okay, so now the following day you get to cook with Papyrus. You step into the Black Swan during the early hours of the morning. It feels unusual to be there so early, but it's not unpleasant. You call out a greeting. Papyrus answers back. In the kitchen, Miss Twinkle. A surge of giddy joy makes you move faster. You head into the kitchen. The Black Swan kitchen is normally pristine, sleek, and well organized. Today, the counters are covered in crates food that are so full they spill over the edge. Even the floor has stacks and stacks of boxes and crates of food. You see numerous egg cartons, milk drugs, bags of flour. It's a lot and your eyes wide in surprise. I know it's a lot, Papyrus says quickly, but it will all be used. And who will eat it? We will. Papyrus laughs at your indescribable look. I just, you may have some of the food and what is left over I will bring to my friends in the Royal Guards. They all have very large appetites. You giggle, relieved you won't have to disappoint him with your inability to consume an entire kitchen with the food in one sitting. Papyrus smiles at you, pleased by your reaction. Do you know the difference between monster food and regular food? Papyrus asks you. You shake your head. Then allow me to explain the fundamental difference is the lack of magic, he says, picking up an apple. Human food is grown on the surface and normally without magic. He holds the apple out to you. You accept the apple. The moment your fingers graze his skeletal hand, a jolt goes through you. Both of you flinch away. Oh no. You feel your cheeks start to burn as a pleasant sensation tightens in your chest. What? Papyrus takes a deep breath as if to calm himself. What does it feel like to you? He asks. <laughs> oh, they are so freaking cute. Help. Your breath hitches and your eyes widen. He wants to know how you feel. <laughs> you sharply look up at him. You face the flame. Prepare your shoulders rise up as he turns. The, the, the apple. How does the, the apple feel in your hands? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, these two. I changed my mind. He's not just hot. He's freaking perfect. A shine adorable. Shut up, Sol. You turn the apple over. It's smooth, red, and looks like a perfectly normal apple, you explain to him. It is, he says. May I have it back? He holds out his hand and you place it inside. When your fingers graze his palm, you feel a jolt again. Better prepared, you don't flinch away. Your gaze moves up to meet him. The two of you hold each other's gaze. Oh my gosh. 
Paris is the first to break away. A talking hue forms under his eye sockets. Oh my god. He clears his throat several times. His eyelids refocus on the apple. Vermilion eye... Vermilion light briefly shines above the fruit. You wonder what it feels like to have that light around you. Oh my. Papyrus offers it to you again. You place a hand over the apple and he places his hand over top of yours. He folds your hand around the apple and holds it intently in his too large hand. Shivers go down your spine. Your lips twitch and you can't fight back a giggle. You can't bring yourself to look at Papyrus. You focus entirely on the apple in your hand and the warmth of his hand around yours. His voice is low and soft as he has. And now? It's smooth red and there's a fuzzy warmth to it. You feel a strange fuzzy sensation around the entire apple. You describe it to Papyrus. He removes his hand. Correct! It is, as you might guess, embedded by my magic. Monster food is with food and magic. We typically grow the food in the Fell Kingdom using magic a rich soil to do so. Not having need to add magic while cooking, explains Papyrus. It's important for monsters to only eat magic food. It is better for us, says Papyrus. Most of us do not have digestive systems like you humans do. Your cheeks warm from that, slightly embarrassed to have an asked an obvious question. Papyrus weighs it off. Questions do not bother me, he says. How else will you learn? You relax at that. We can consume non-magical food, but too much will make us sick, he says. In my case, my magic is strong enough to break down the food without additional magic. I can eat a lot more than, say, a child monster whose magic is still growing. So, it's really the magic that the monsters need to consume? Magic that breaks things down for them? Yes. Could humans eat it without issue? Yes, says Papyrus. Go ahead and try the apple. You take a bite of the apple, a burst of sweet, juicy flesh enters your mouth. It tastes normal, albeit when you swallow you feel a cottony aftertaste in your mouth. It's strange. In its raw form, it will linger, says Papyrus. Excellent cooks like myself can use our magic to transform dishes into something extraordinary. I was glad to show you today. You thought he was testing the human gadgets. I am, he says, but you deserve a reward for coming in on a day off. You giggle. You won't say no to free food, especially if it's good. Papyrus chuckles. Let's start with something simple first. I want to know how you are, are supposed to use an oven. Right away, the two of you start to get to work at learning him how to use the oven. Oh my god. You show him how to use the appliance. He's clever, so it doesn't take him long to grasp it. As soon as he understands, he starts cooking with you, acting as he's so stiff. The two of you have a variety of dishes sampling and tasting each one along the way and chatting while you do. Papyrus is happy to talk while he works. He answers any questions you might have without hesitation and freely indulge you to curiosity. You ask him. Okay, I'm going to ask him, of course, about who who chose about the restaurant. I, I Let's ask him this. Who asked about the restaurant? Yes, this is my prize. Oh, wait, hold on. Wrong question. Go back. This isn't the one I want. It's the... Where is it? Why... What made him choose the black swan? My brother San suggested it. I scouted it, liked it, and chose it. Why did Sans suggest it? I don't know. Okay, so I don't think any of this has changed, so we will be back in a little bit. Okay, so I asked Papyrus a bunch of questions, and when you talk about the Royal Guard, Papyrus will blush a little, which is so freaking cute. I didn't include it here because it was such a small scene, and of course there is like a tiny bit of a blush reaction as well when you talk about um, what he thinks of the surface world. So. That being aside, as you approach noon, Papyrus decides it would be good to start making a dessert. He instructs you to open the flower jar while he works on tempering the chocolate. Mm. You struggle with the flower jar. <coughs> Papyrus notices and turns to help you. Pop! Flower shoots out and covers you both. There's a moment of stunned silence. You stare at your boss, a tall skeleton monster with jagged scars and vermilion eyes, who is now covered in flour. You proceed to then giggle. <laughs> Papyrus stares at you for another moment, and then he starts to laugh as well. <laughs> you look like a ghost, he says. He lifts a hand out to you and gently brushes the back of his knuckle against your cheek. The flower rubs off with ease, as though you can feel your face heating up once more. Papyrus steps closer to you and raises another hand. He hesitates for a moment, then uses his hand to start to brush the flower off of your other cheek. Your heart clenches. He cups your face in both of his 
Hans! Oh, bye! Miss Twinkle, he says softly. Looks like I came back at the perfect time. Trolls a deep voice. Papyrus jumps and immediately steps away from you. <gasps> Damn you, Sans! Brother, you have the most terrible timing! Oh, come on. I just wanted to, you know, keep an eye on my bro. You know? Sans, I am going to murder you in this route. Not just Papyrus. Papyrus isn't the only one that's going to murder you. I'm going to murder you. How dare you interrupt that? That was cute. He could have... We could have... <laughs> Did you just stop me from possibly having a kissing scene? How dare you? He either stopped a kissing scene or he stopped a really cutesy scene or Papyrus admitting his feelings. Either way, he just blocked. He literally just got blocked. How dare you? Is that where I use the term? Is that where this term is used? Is this term used appropriately in that sentence or did I do it wrong? He just, he kind of... He blocked! How dare you! You are soaking an egg in the face. You frown, disappointment crashing into you. You give the newcomer a withering stare. A familiar large skeleton enters the kitchen. It takes you several moments to recall where you saw this monster before. He was the first skeleton monster you saw. He came to the black swans from several nights ago as a customer. You saw him and Papyrus talking to each other outside the black swan. He reminds you of both the Paris and Wingerdings. Brothers, perhaps. You met Wingerding, so maybe this is Sans. You wonder if they are close to you. If they are close, as you and Lawrence were... Are. You and Lawrence are. The skeleton wings. What's the matter, baby bones? You're looking paler than usual. Is it flower or not the black swan? Papyrus eye socket's narrow. You glance between the two. Hello, Sans, says Papyrus. You have the worst timing. Leave. I don't know, says Sans, his grin stretching wide as he struggles to not outright laugh. You look like you needed some help. He doesn't need your help. He has me. He snickers. Don't you really want to say no? His snicker turns louder as he laughs at his own pun. <laughs> I could be your man of the flower any <laughs> time of need. Sans laughs with his whole body. What comes next is too fast for you to follow. One moment Sans is laughing, the next he has two eggs splattered on his face. Go on, you papyrus! Teach him a lesson for interrupting this cute moment. How dare he? Come on, Twinkle. You loved me in my row. Yeah, but you just interrupted Papyrus. How dare you? You just denied me a cutesy scene. How dare you? Nobody does that without me getting vengeance. Papyrus smirks and he chuckles five eggs. What's wrong, brother? Not in such an excellent mood now. Ha! Huh. Sans loudly laughs as he glares. His matching grin looks downright menacing. Forgo how funny you can be, Pops. There's a zoom of something going by you. The bowl of melted chocolate that was once beside you now sits upside down on Papyrus' head. Chocolate rips down, drips down him. Ha <laughs> ha! Papyrus growls, and so the war has begun. Food flies everywhere. You do your best to dodge and duck out of the way. Once you're in the safe zone, you realise you have a choice to make. Side with Papyrus or side with Sans, Papyrus' brother. You carefully considered your options. If this situation had been reversed, what would you want? If you and Lawrence were playfully fighting, would you want Papyrus to join your side or join Lawrence? Um... I want him to choose me regardless of the situation because Lawrence has probably got a better aiming throw than I do. You throw a can of eggs at Sans for obviously interrupting the moment earlier and because he 100% freaking deserved it because nobody interrupted him during his moment. You say it's time to help out your boss, like any loyal worker. You throw a box of eggs at the back of Sans head. Papyrus cackles with light. Well done! Papyrus, <laughs> Sans growled. You made your choice. Yes, you did. Sans pelts your tomatoes hard enough that they splutter against you. Oh, that's cold and squishy. Revenge will be yours. Within an hour, you've run out of food to throw. The kitchen is a mess. The three of you look like you went dumpster diving behind a diner at the end of a slow night. You're grinning. It's only a moment to catch your breath when someone else walks in. And in walks another skeleton. Sans, how long does it take to fetch... What the fuck? Ah, oh, it's Wingerdings. Wingerdings gasps surveys the kitchen. He looks at the food-covered walls and appliances. The floor is also a mess, you can't even see the tiles anymore, and he looks at his brothers and you, who are equally dirty. He says at the three of you in disbelief. 
you are adults. He started. He instigated it. You are adults. Wingedings repeats numbly. You offer Wingedings an apology. He placed a hand over his face. Clean this up, all of you. To your surprise, you see that he uses his shadow to grab his stool from the bar and pull it into the kitchen, and he takes a seat on it. Sans looks mildly concerned. Are you going to watch us? Evidently, I must, he mutters. You two cannot be trusted to behave like adults. Papyrus looks embarrassed. The color in your eye sockets darken to red, and he glances away. You feel a twinge in your chest. You ask if this is a common occurrence. Yes, says Wingy Dings. At the same time, Papyrus and Sans deny it. Oh, come on, says Sans. I ain't never done a food fight with Pops before. But you two have destroyed several restaurants and bars, snies Wingy Dings. Disdain evident in his tone. Destroy seems too harsh of a word. If the stains and damages are so atrocious that the owners cannot reopen, then destroy is absolutely the correct word to use. Oh, uh, go Sans. Sans shrugs. We can hire a cleaning staff for this. Pay him well, no need for us to need a time out, Wingeting says quietly. Papyrus and Sans shake their head. Time out. Don't ask. Papyrus warns you immediately. Your mess, you clean it up. Regardless of how adorable that scene must have been. Stresses Wingy Dings. The three of you exchange glances. Well, your mess. You help them. Clean it up. You are so sticky and sticky by the end. Once the kitchen is immaculate, you are not. All you want to do is take a hot shower. It wasn't a bad time, though. Sans and Papyrus and Wingy Dings would bicker with one another in a comforting familiarity that puts you at ease. You shouldn't feel like the odd one out, as each brother would make it a point to include you in the conversation. Especially Papyrus. He kept hovering around you. The two of you constantly exchanging quick smiles when you made eye contact. If his brothers noticed, they politely ignored it. But deep down, they're like, Oh, Sans, look, aren't you little baby, baby Bones' brother? Look at him. Oh, he really does like the human. Oh, it's really cute. They're so cute together. Then, of course, if she's on our route or my route, then this would be completely different. I'd be slightly annoyed. That's unless a harem right is installed, dear brother. But even then, it'll be a push for me. Don't give the dev ideas for a harem route. I don't think Twinkle would survive. Oh, she could barely survive the harem route for if underfell. Future Twinkle here stepping in to interrupt these two from even continuing down their conversation. They get a bit saucy. Let's just not go there, okay? This was just not suitable and thus was removed. Oh, come on. It wasn't that bad. Oh, I honestly wish you kept it in. It is late afternoon by the time everything has been restored. Miss Twinkle, says Papyrus, thank you for, for your help. Of course, you'd help make it. It's only fair for you to help clean it up. I appreciate it, says Papyrus. It, he hesitates, has come to my attention that we are short staff tomorrow. Would you be able to come in? You hesitate. You had evening plans. You have to... I would greatly appreciate it, says Papyrus. Okay. Would you like one of us to escort you home? Wingedings politely offers. All three of them look at you expectantly. You shake your head and thank them. Very well. Do keep safe. Yes, you always do. Because technically, it's we're after Papyrus. They're not going to do anything and result in Papyrus having to step in and keep them under control. You head home. Long story short, some shenanigans happened involving Roltsy and Clara who decided to help me put up posters seeing as when I went to go to the Black Swan as per Papyrus's request. Uh, the place wasn't under staff, they didn't really need me in that day so we decided to literally go hang out and go put up posters. And I also told them about my missing brother because, again, Lawrence is still freaking missing as usual. <sighs> Gosh darn it. So now we're heading back to the Black Swan. You head back to the Black Swan, anxious to see if Papyrus would be there. Why you do not regret your choice, you want to check upon Papyrus and... You enter the restaurant feel your soul thump in your chest. Your pink eyes scan the area searching for him. You find him, the same second he finds you. Papyrus casts his steps out of the kitchen and immediately notices you. The tall skeleton monster strides forward and grasps both of your arms. Where did you go? You... Why did you leave, he asks. Then he starts to turn you around. Are you hurt? No, you're fine. Oh my god, poor precious baby. 
Only after you're satisfied that you are not heard, he stops turning you around. He glares at you. You left. Yes, you're sorry. I forgive you, he says. Do not do it again. You won't. Papaya smiles at you. Since you came back, I will walk you home. You giggle. <laughs> wow. He's like, I can't stay mad at you. So it's all right for now. Papyrus walks you home. When you arrive at your apartment, there are police there. Of course, of course. It looks like there was a raid or something while you were at work. You tightly rub your eyes. You don't want to have to deal with this. But what choice do you have? Please allow me, says Papyrus. Huh? Papyrus steps over the do not cross tape with ease. Some of the officers spare him a glance, but also they realise who it is. They politely ignore him. He lifts the tape up for you. You duck underneath. Papyrus has connections to the police. Police, royal family business. Many connections, he muses. Some of my own making and some from my brother. You do not need to worry about this. You see... You do? Papyrus escorts you up to your apartment. He offers you a gracious bow. We've arrived safe. I hope you have a pleasant night. Papyrus hesitates. He then bends down and places a quick kiss on your cheek. Oh my god! Papyrus straightens up and clears his throat, a red hue under his eyelids. Ah, uh, <clears throat> Your face burns and you can't fight the silly grin you get. I hope that it is, uh, fine with you. More than fine. Papyrus smiles at you, his skull darkening the cu to cute red. Good, good. Have a pleasant night, Miss Twinkle. You tell him to do the same. End of chapter six. Oh my god, that was the end of it. That was freaking adorable. <laughs> Papyrus is such a cinnamon roll. He, oh my god, oh, oh, have mercy on my soul. Well then, you guys want to papyrus this right? I hope you're happy. I'm happy. I'm really happy with that. It was, it was like really sweet. Papyrus was. These three brothers are so intricately different to each other and I really love that fact about them that no two are exactly the same. Some are bombastic, the other one is more cunning and then you've got this one who although is loud and you think would be a bit more forward, he's quite shy and like very, very gentleman. I, I absolutely love Papyrus's road. This was so freaking adorable. <sighs> I'm going to save, but hey, look at that. Look at me. We did it, folks. We did it. We got Papyrus. We have completed Papyrus. Papyrus chapter six. Oh, gosh. You guys wanted his route? You got his route. I am happy we went for this route. Huh. And before anybody asks, no, at present there are no bad endings in Papyrus's route at all, so you guys won't get any bonus in at the end. Sorry. Not for you today, sorry. Oh, right, so I've now got Ralsei's Ezreal slash Ralsei, Ralsei's right to do and friendship from Mafia Fell. Oh my god. I need to go lay down. Oh my. Oh my goodness. <laughs>